Martin Weller, welcome to Eden. Uh, your keynote speech this morning featured uh, a talk on the battle for open. And in it, you indicated that actually the battle may not be over. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's an interesting period, really. I think so we've, in many ways, open has been victorious. And by that, I mean it's moved from being a kind of very peripheral interest into the mainstream. And you see that with kind of the, the victory of the open access movement, OERs, MOOCs, open scholarship. So in some ways, it's a time to celebrate, you know, particularly if you've been in the field of open education for a long time. It's kind of, we couldn't have dreamt of this kind of level of success five, ten years ago. But it's like a lot of things, actually. It's after that initial victory that the really interesting time comes. And the kind of historical example I gave was the French Revolution. It kind of like, so you have this big victory, but actually after that, the real kind of direction was decided. And, and that's the period we're in now. And so there's kind of lots of struggles and tensions to be determined, I think. What are these tensions? What are the roadblocks, do you think? It's not so much roadblocks. It's about now that it matters. It's like when openness or open education didn't really matter to anyone, you could do what you wanted. But as soon as it, it matters, <laughs> so it has value, kind of commercial value, or just the term itself is value, then other people want to have, have a piece of that. Uh, and sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's not. So, you know, MOOCs are a really good example. They kind of it brought in lots of innovation, lots of success, but also there was a certain, it led to a certain take on what openness meant. And, and for them, it just meant uh, open access in terms of open entry, it was free, but rather, but none of the kind of other principles of openness that we might associate, such as open licensing and stuff. So it's about trying to see who owns the direction of openness. And I think it's a real danger for us in education that it gets taken away from us before we even realise that that's happened. You mentioned MOOCs. Uh, there are many different types of MOOCs, of course. And uh, you had a bit of a parody this morning on the different names that we could use for MOOCs. Mm. But the X MOOC, the, this kind of idea that now the MOOC has become almost a commercial proposition. Mm. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism about that. Uh, things like, you know, the, the, the shallow list of learning, you know, the lack of um, completion rates. What, what's your response to that? I think people can be a bit snobby, actually, about kind of MOOCs. It's like, oh, the, the X MOOCs aren't proper MOOCs compared to other. And I think they're all doing a good, really, really good job. So I've um, I, I did a project where I had to kind of look at a, a big range of MOOCs. I looked at C MOOCs and kind of a lot of the X MOOCs from people like Coursera and Udacity. And some of them are really good. So it depends what you want, you know. So I looked at, for instance, the Introduction to Psychology, and I did my first degree in psychology, and I found it really good. It was, it was good to go back and learn that stuff and refresh. So I think we should, you know, if people are learning and getting value from it, you know, you shouldn't be snobbish about that. That's good stuff. But I think you know, there are issues around um, completion rates, those kind of things. So I think the issue is not so much about their quality or their, their pedagogy. It's about some of the, the claims that people made. So like if, if you said some people were going to have lots of people interested in learning and some will complete, some won't, but they'll be engaged and it will raise the, the level of learning around and it's all open free, that's a good thing. But when you start saying it's going to completely disrupt higher education, change the system, be a revolution. Then it's those kind of overblown claims, I think, that then people react against. I think yeah, a bit of hyperbole, hyperbole coming exactly, in there. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, tell us a little bit about um, your views on open scholarship, because this, uh, I think, is going to be an important concept in the future of education, isn't it? Yeah. So I, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called The Digital Scholar. Uh, and really, it could have been called the Open Scholar, because I think it's that intersection of digital network and openness that kind of leads to transformative practice. So I think that's, I wouldn't really have a, a definite definition of what an Open Scholar is, but it's more about a kind of set of principles and behaviours you might see. So it's, it's sharing stuff openly, it's having an online network, and often that online network is as important, if not more important, than your kind of physical network of people you work with in, in your discipline. So Open Scholars would be people who blog, you know, um, Different, use different media, use YouTube, perhaps use Twitter. So it's a kind of a way of engaging. And those environments have their own kind of cultural norms in a way, which I think are often quite distinct from your disciplinary norms. So I think it's an interesting intersection between as those two kind of cultures come together. So uh, is there, has there any, any research been done in that kind of area, looking at the, the intersection, looking at maybe the change in psychological mindset as well? Um, that's a good question, Steve. <laughs> a bit, I think. So we're seeing. So, for instance, uh, uh, Bonnie Stewart has done some really good work around uh, academic identity on Twitter, and you know, her work really kind of shows up how valuable those online networks are, particularly for people who are quite isolated in their kind of physical campus. They might be the only person who's into this kind of online identity, digital scholarship stuff. But their online identity is, is, is sometimes far exceeds their kind of. Uh, the, one, the kind of reputation they might have locally in a way. So it's almost like you have this kind of dual identity. 
Martin, thank you for giving us your time today um, and best wishes for the success of your future research. Thank you.